Well, we're glad you're here today. Let's take your Bibles, if you would please, this morning and open them to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, as we continue our mini-series on the seven churches of Revelation. This morning we're looking at the fourth church, the church of Thyatira. This church was now fully established for nearly 40 years. It's been established, and not only was it established as a church, but it was established as a state. Yet in all three of these churches, they were still true to the faith and had not yielded to the onslaught and the assaults of Satan and all that he had as far as the majority was concerned. Even though the Lord rebuked two of these churches, He had somewhat against them because there's, there's always going to be a group. And, and in this situation, you had the majority of these three churches, 75% or greater of them, were in, uh, uh, in tune with the Lord, were dedicated, committed, sold out, serving, honoring, faithful, dependable uh, uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's always a group that you know wants to rebel against that. And, and we find... a. But there's always going to be a group, and in this particular, particular time, in these three churches, they were the minority in the church that, that the Lord had someone against. They had gone off into false doctrine and erroneous doctrine and error and idolatry and immorality and all that stuff in the church. Remember, this is letters written to the church. This is the Lord writing letters to His churches. Okay? These are mainly made up of believers. But yet, as any given church, there's always non-believers in a church. Not everybody is saved that comes to church. Not everybody that sits in church every Sunday is born again and has a relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible said that Jesus said the wheat and the tare will grow up together. So you're always going to have tares in the church. And he also said there'll be sheep and goat. So you've got to decide, determine what are you. Are you a sheep or a goat? Are you wheat or are you a tear? But it's in the church. But when we come to the church of Thyatira, things are going to flip-flop. Now we're going to go just the opposite. Where 75% of the church now is going to go in the opposite direction and become seduced by false doctrine and erroneous doctrine and teaching and immorality and paganism and idolatry and everything that goes on and about 25% are going to hold true to the faith and that's the remnant. And it switches from this time on till to the present day in which we live. It's where we're at. Gives you an idea of what's going on in the church. See, there was that switch that changed. That's why even the Lord said in verse 24 there in your outline, the phrase, the deep things of Satan. This reveals how far the Thyatira church had slipped in relation to those at Smyrna and Pergamos. So this is a message to the church as well as our church that false doctrine, listen to me, false erroneous doctrine and sin should not be allowed in the church. Boy, it ought to be a stronger amen than that. It's not popular. Okay? It's not popular. But the church of Jesus Christ, the remnant that's still going to be around and left, should not tolerate sin False doctrine, erroneous doctrine, compromise, worldliness, you see, uh, laziness, lax, all that we've been looking, corruption, we should, all that was going on in the church. And now it had switched from being a minority to the majority in the church. And we should not allow that. In spite of, look what I said there, even under the banner, and I listed three things, the banner of love, the banner of toleration, and the banner of unity. And see, and that's what we've got going on today in the church. They accept anything and everything today. We tolerate sin under the banner of unity. We tolerate sin under the banner of love. We compromise. We water it down. We sugarcoat it. We've become worldly and compromising and corrupted all under the banner of love, toleration, and unity. And yet, we're in deep trouble. Now, see, people don't want to hear this, but my job's not to... Uh, make you feel good in some one sense, but it's to tell you the truth. Okay? And, and that's where we got to be, the remnant. So I said in the Sunday school hour before Brother Ted brought the a message to us that we, I want to be a part of God's remnant. And that part's going to stay true to the Word of God, whether it's popular or not. You see. 
We're not going to be so liked and so popular because we take a stand for biblical doctrinal teaching in the Word of God, try to obey it, live by it, apply it, because it's not popular today in the modern church. So Jesus had a lot to say about it. So let's begin to look at it here in chapter 2, if we can, uh, beginning in verse number 18. And unto the angel of the church. Now, who's the angel? Pastor, the messenger, okay? So I've got a letter coming from the Lord, amen? amen. All right. Write, these things saith the Son of God. Boy, that's authority right there. That's a term used for the deity of Jesus Christ, proving that He is God. Are you with me? Okay. So we have, Who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. So John pictures the Lord Jesus Christ here standing in his church as one with eyes as flame as fire. Now that's in your outline there if you look at it. Christ is pictured there. The one with eyes like a flame of fire. That is, he's got two piercing laser eyes. Eyes like laser that can penetrate anything. Amen? Nothing goes unseen by the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing can be covered that He cannot uncover with His laser piercing eyes. So that's how He stands in the church today. So, uh, boy, let's pay attention what He's got to say here. <coughs> and then He also says that His feet are like fine brass. And then we'll get to the third one there in just a moment. So John is picturing the Lord Jesus Christ here. What might you think the third one would be? What does this picture a person as? The Lord Jesus Christ. One with eyes that are flaming a, a flame of fire, with piercing laser, uh, laser eyes. One that would stand with, with feet that have been in the furnace and brazing a bronze of a, of a furnace. Uh, what, what would that picture the Lord as? Turn over to Revelation chapter 1, if you would, please. Turn back to Revelation chapter 1. <coughs> as John uh, himself gets to see the Lord here. Revelation chapter 1, look at verse 14 with me if you would please. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Revelation chapter 1 verse 14. Verse 15. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burn in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Now that's John's picture of him in chapter 1. Now he gives another picture of him in chapter 2 as, as of his appearance to the church. Revelation chapter 19, if you would please. Everybody there? First John sees him in chapter 1. Then he's seen again in chapter 2 in this uh, uh, figuration. And then we see him all the way at the end of the tribulation hour in chapter 19 and beginning in verse number 12, if you would please. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed upon him with white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth, now here it is, verse 15, goeth a sharp sword. We've already learned. is the Word of God. So out of his mouth goes the word of God to it, what? That it should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. What does that speak of? What? Tell me, what's that speak of? Judgment. So number three, John pictures our Lord as the divine judge. He is the divine judge, and he's standing in the midst of his church as a divine judge. See, everybody wants to hear about the love of God, but nobody wants to hear about the judgment of God. And by the way, the Bible has more to say about the judgment of God than it does the love of God. Okay? Because, friend, what's going to be important is where you're going to spend eternity. And whether you believe it or not or like it or not, it makes no difference. He is the judge of the universe. And every one of us one day will stand before this judge and give an account of ourselves, just depending on which judgment you're going to stand at. 
You can stand at the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, if you're a saved person and born again, or you will stand at the great white throne judgment if you're lost without Christ. And I want to tell you, there is a big, big difference. Matter of fact, about seven, about seven years and a thousand and seven years separate between the two. But every man is going to give an account. Every woman is going to give an account. Every boy, girl, young person will give an account of their deeds, their works, of what they have done, whether good or bad, whether you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ or whether you stand before the great white throne judgment. And here he's pictured as he comes to this church of fire tar during this time as the divine judge. Woo! You think standing before judges today and, and, and this uh, earthly judges, that's nothing compared to standing before the Lord Jesus Christ. So here he is. So we see that's what he does, and there's a picture of it. There's some other verses for you to, to, to discover that. Let's go on to number two now. Let's look at the commendation. He begins to praise them. He begins to commend them for some things. Now remember who he's giving this praise to. Remember, now the church has flip-flopped. Now we got 75% of the church has gone in the opposite direction, and there's only a remnant left. So this praise goes to the remnant. This praise is going to go to the true child of God that is sold out, dedicated, committed, faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the rest are in the other group. What group are you in? So let's take a look at it as he commends them. Notice with me in verse number 19. He says, I know thy works, or deeds, if you'd like, please, and charity, or love, and service, and faith, and thy patience. And then notice he says, And thy works, and the last to be more than the first. In other words, their works, their deeds, at the last are greater than they were at the first. And then notice he divides it into four categories. He lists them right here. Let's see if we can pick them out. Four categories. And I've broken those up into two for you. Out of the four. These are great virtues for the church to have. These are great virtues for you and I to have as believers, okay? Because the Lord's commending us for these. And the first one is that is love. He commends them for their love. And notice what I have there. Love for God and for one another. Who? This remnant. This remnant. Their love for God and one another. And remember now, it's flip-flop, and I'll give you a reason why and tell you why right over here in Second Timothy, matter of fact. I'll show you why, because in Second Timothy chapter 3, you might want to write it down as a cross-reference verse here. This is why I say, you see, there's just a remnant in the church today that really do love God and love others. Are you listening to me? Say, preacher, how can you make that statement? Well, because of what Paul told young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 in verse number 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times will come. Are you with me? Verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Verse 4. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of of God. That depicts the church today. That's that 75 to 80 percent that has flip-flopped, you see, and, and, and it's in the church because he's standing in his church and he's telling his church, he's praising this group, this remnant uh, that wants to be loyal, faithful, dedicated to the Lord. He said, I want to praise you for your love for me and I want to commend you for your love one for another because in the last days, uh, as we continue to move on to the coming of Christ, there's going to be a total flip-flop of the church and the direction it's going in. And there Timothy just gives us that. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Then notice he praised them in, in uh, number two there. He praised them for their faith. In other words, they were dependable. They were reliable. They were consistent. Boy, if there's anything missing in the church today of Jesus Christ, are those three things right there. I want to tell you this. Now listen to me. I love you, but I've got to tell you the truth. Consistency, faithfulness, Dependability, reliability has become obsolete in the church today. You know why? Because the majority is living in that 75 to 80 percent. They have flip-flops, you see. Just what the Bible says would happen and what they would do. 
And that's why we don't have what we have. See what we have going on. And yet there are many churches that are full and there are many that are empty. The ones that are full are in that 75 to 80% flip-flop. Oh, yes. Don't have time to go into all of it. But I could prove it to you. But he said, I want to thank you all for being dependable, reliable, consistent, faithful, hey, involved. Now, when you and I have that kind of love and faith for the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to result or produce two of the other virtues that he praised them for. Let's look at number three there. The results. And he's noticed what else he praised them for. For their service. Uh-oh. He praised them for their service. That's their commitment. That's their activity. That's their responsibility. That's their reliability. That's their dependability and the work of the Lord in the church. Are you listening to me? All work in giving today is done by 10% of the people and 90% of the other direction in the church today. Why? Well, because the Bible says so. There's such a lack today of service in the church. But yet there's always going to be a remnant, Ted. And I don't know about you, but my heart's desire is to be a part of the remnant. Amen. Because God praises the remnant, but He's going to judge the other group. Amen. Hello? In His church, even if you're, quote, saved. Oh, this is not popular. No, but it's the Word of God. Amen. You see? It's the truth. And you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And if you know the truth, you then you shall be free indeed. God's always got a remnant. That's why He said, even in the last days, He said, when I return, He said, will I even find any faith still on the earth? Why? Because the church has become the apostate church. There's the falling away of the faith. It's all, you read Second, First and Second Timothy, man, it's all there. Heavy duty. Okay, we don't have time to go into it. So he praises them for their service, uh, which is going to be the results, you see, of your love and of your faith if you are sold out, dedicated, dependent, uh, reliable, you see, committed, you see, uh, in your love and, and in your uh, faith for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to produce service for the Lord Jesus Christ in and through the local church. Because this is a letter to the church. Are you with me? What is the church? The body of Christ. That's you and I. Amen? And then notice what else he praised them for. He praised them for their patience. Or you could put perseverance there if you wanted to. In number four, two there on, under results. So what's the results then of our love and faith uh, and our works, our righteous deeds that we do for the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, uh, and then notice what he said that their works or their deeds, their righteous works and deeds, he noticed, he said, they were greater in number than they were at the first. Are you with me? They were great. The what? Their righteous deeds and acts. In other words, their love for the Lord, their faith, their servants, you see, their patience. He says, it was greater in the end than it was in the beginning. To who? This remnant. Are you with me? Okay. In other words, their loving service was becoming more consistent and their faithful perseverance was growing stronger and stronger in the Lord. And where are we at today? I don't see that. Do you see that today? No, I don't see that today. So we're lacking in that, aren't we? Amen? Amen. Come on now. I'm trying to get you to see, open your eyes to what the Scripture says, what the Word of God teaches. You see, so for us here at West Marion, you know what our heart's desire ought to be? We ought to desire to want to be this remnant that we would become even greater servants. We would become even more dedicated, more faithful, more dependable, more reliable uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ that our love and our faith is growing and growing for our service and the reliability as we see the day of Christ approaching and not going in the opposite direction. Because that's what he praised them for. That's what he commended them for. But yet I don't see it. I see it going just the opposite. I see it becoming the 75 to 80 percent. Well, let's see. So there's the praise. 
So if only anybody raised your hand or answer, how many are in that group? Are you in that remnant? I mean, you, the Holy Spirit's searching your heart. Remember, you can't lie to the Holy Ghost. You can't lie to the Lord, because remember, the Lord is standing in this church today, in His church, with eyes like laser beams that can pierce into our hearts and knows the intent of our heart and every thought that we're thinking. You can't hide nothing from Him. You can't get nothing by Him, my friend. He is the judge of all the universe. Well, you can pretend, you can fake yourself out, but you're not going to fake God out. You're not going to pull the wool over His eyes. So now he gets to the other group in the church. Woo! What group are you in? Let's take a look at it. Back to Revelation chapter 2. Let's look at verse number 20 through 23. Here we find the complaint or his concern about his church. Notice verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Are you with me? Now, I know we don't want to say this, but say, God's got a few things against me. Well, some of you believe that. Let's not be so spiritual, folks. Let's get down where the water meets the road. I haven't met a perfect person yet. The only perfect person I met was spiritually, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we all still sin, amen? We all still struggle with this flesh. We all have problems. All right, so we can honestly stand and say the Lord's got something against us. Because that's what the Word says. Well, let's see what he says. He says, A few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants. Now, notice, see how he's talking to believers? He calls them, Jesus calls them in his church, my servants. Are you listening? Amen. To commit fornication, that's sexual immorality, by the way, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So here's his complaint. He said, man, you're tolerating this false prophetess Jezebel. Now, it wasn't Jezebel herself, because you've got to remember, she lived back in the Old Testament. It's a type. There was a woman, a prophetess, a preacher, coming into the church, and with false doctrine and erroneous doctrine, leading the people of God astray and again, seducing them and getting them involved in all kinds of sins and immorality and all kinds of idolatry and paganism and false worship and false everything contrary to the Word of God under the tolerance of sin, under, the to under unity and under love. And the church was eating it up. Are you listening to me? Jezebel. How many of you remember Jezebel? You remember in 1 Kings the story of Ahab? King Ahab was the king of Israel. And the Bible says that King Ahab did more evil and more wickedness than all the kings put together of the nation of Israel. And said why? Because he married Jezebel. That false prophet that called herself a prophet. And she began to seduce the nation of Israel, God's people, and led them into all kinds of sexual immorality, led them all kinds of idolatry and pagan worship and everything else under the sun. But God's always got a remnant. And he says the same thing's going on in the church today that are being seduced with false doctrine erroneous era, false teaching of the Scriptures, the twisting of the Scriptures to meet everybody's agenda, everybody's program, to pad their pocketbooks, to accomplish whatever they want. They'll take and twist and everything else in the Scripture. And I won't go into all the part about it being a woman and a Jezebel and taking through the Scriptures and all of that. I don't have time for that, okay? Uh, but some other time we'll take a look at that more closely, all right? What was she doing? First thing, false doctrine. False doctrine. Man, she was heavy into false doctrine. You tell me doctrine doesn't matter in the church today? Absolutely. Amen. That is the ruin and the wreck of every church is er er erroneous, false doctrine and teaching in the church. And it's interesting, they take the Word of God to do it. Through deception, deceiving, changing the Word of God, altering the Word of God, making it fit their agenda, their program, 
pad and line their pockets of prosperity, all under the disguise of the Word of God and everything else, and yet it is false, erroneous doctrine. It is the spirit of Jezebel. You see, that's why we're not popular here. Because we won't compromise the Word of God. We're not going to water it down, sugarcoat it, twist it, change it, or anything else. We're going to take it right for what it says. And if God says, I'm a skunk, then I'm a skunk. If God says, I'm an old sinner and a reprobate, then that's exactly what I am. Because that's what God says I am. God says, I'm a worm, then I'm a worm. If God says, I'm living in sin, then I'm living in sin. If God says He doesn't like the way I'm living and what I'm doing, then that's just the way it is. I don't change the Word of God to make it fit my lifestyle. I don't change the Word of God to make it fit yours or to make you feel good and comfortable. We're not going to water it down, compromise it, sugarcoat it, soften it up so we can get a big crowd here, so we can have 80% of the other group. Of the group that's gone after false doctrine and teaching and paganism and sexual immorality is rampant in the church. I know people right now that I led to Christ, that I baptized, that are living in sin. That are shacked up, living together in open sexual immorality that claim to be saved. They're in that 75-80% group. They're not in the remnant. And the Lord stands here as a judge and says, I see it, I know it. But oh, we got to love them and we got to make them feel good and we got to tell them that that sin's okay just as long as you come to church. Just as long as you give some money in the offering, you can do anything you want to do. We don't need your money that bad. Because it's that sin, if you don't repent and get out of it, is what he says in the next verse here, and you continue to live in that sin, and there's no chastening in your life, you're going to die lost in your sin and split hell wide open. And my job is to do the best I can to get you to see that and repent and get right with God and get saved so you can go to heaven. Get mad at me if you want to. Call me whatever you want to. Say I'm narrow-minded, tunnel vision, dogmatic, too straight, too late, whatever. That's okay. But if you get saved, hallelujah. Because somebody's going to tell you the truth. It's number two, sexual immorality. Number three, idolatry. Number four, eating things sacrificed to idols. This was the sin of Jezebel. You just apply it to the day in which we're living in. I'll tell you, man, sexual immorality is fluently flaunting and flowing today. Would you agree with that? Amen. Oh, come on now. You see, you're getting too soft on this stuff. You want to enjoy the privileges and the pleasures of that, my friend? Then get to the altar under holy matrimony and get married. Amen. And then go have all the fun you want. I know I didn't gain popularity to that with that one. But we told you the truth because I love you. And it's in the church. Idolatry is anything you put before the Lord, anything that comes first in your life before the Lord, anything you spend more time, talent, treasure, money on, then God, it's just, that's what it is. Eating things sacrificed to idols. Well, that's all that garbage and stuff that you, that, that, that you sacrifice uh, to your idols rather than you do to the Lord. So you don't have to go out and eat a piece of meat that we sacrifice to some Buddha statue over here. Amen? So you see, apply it to the day. So there was a the complaint. And he says it's rampant and it was in the church. See, that's the complaint to that group. See, the church flip-flopped in this church. It flip-flopped. And they became the majority and the remnant became the minority. Are you with me? All right, so verse 21, real plain and simple, the correction. I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. So what's the correction? Repent. God's always got a correction. And it's amazing how God's people in the church don't want to repent. Folks, there's nothing wrong with repentance. It's a good thing. It's a positive thing. It's a right thing. Repentance is what gets you back in relationship with the Lord. Repentance is what gets you back closer to the walk with the Lord. Repentance is what will get you saved if you're lost. 
So see, that's all good things. That's positive things. Shame on these preachers that won't preach the truth. That are filled with hundreds and hundreds every week in their pulpits and stand there to please the people and to make them feel good and that everything's okay and we tolerate everything as long as we maintain unity, as long as we love everybody and let everybody go to hell. It's okay. God help us. That's why we're in the condition and the shape we're in. And Jesus said so in the last days. This is where we're headed. Are you with me? Say hello. Well, I say I caught you. I said say hello. <laughs> ah, I got you on that. But you're paying attention. Praise God. Amen. All right, let's look. Let's, so that's the correction. Let's look at the judgments that's threatened here real quickly as we move along. The judgments threatened in verses 22 and 23. Notice in verse 20, uh, 21, he told her, he says, what? You need to repent. You need to repent. Church, you need to repent. Person that claims to be saved and, and you're tolerating sin and you're living in sin and, and you're just letting it go and you're living in the world and the way of the world and compromise, you need to repent. Verse 22. Notice the judgment now. Behold, I will cast her into a bed. Now that bed there literally is a bed of death, by the way, and it's a bed of death in hell. Hello. This is the judgment. And who's this letter to? The church and them that commit adultery with her. All those that follow her false doctrine and teaching and erroneous error that's going on in the church that wants to be in that major group now, that, that, that group that tolerates everything. Notice what he says. Jesus said, I'm going to cast her into a bell, and that bed is the bed of death and hell. And all of those that go with her, notice what he's going to do with you. I will cast you into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Are you with me? Now, the word great tribulation there, uh, there's a couple of meanings here. I'm going to talk about it for just a second here, all right? Uh, first of all, the, word, the phrase there, great tribulation, means great distress or trouble. In other words, you see, if he's speaking to the believer here, now listen to me, and you're saved, but you're living in that, that, multi, that, that, that high percentage group that we're talking about, and you, you're tolerating sin in your life, you're compromising, your world, you're living like the world, you're lackadaisical, and, and everything that we've talked about in your life, and you've been following all this other stuff, the Lord said, I'm going to put such distress on you, I'm going to put such tribulation on you, unless you repent. And Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. Job said, man born of woman, his days are full of sorrow. And you wonder why some believers are going through what they're going through. And if you're not, hang on, get ready. Because the judge stands here today and he says, listen, if you don't repent of your lifestyle and the way you're living and the way you're going, I'm going to put you under such distress and such trouble. Whoa. Because of your deeds, right? Right? That's why Paul said everybody that is saved will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of themselves of everything that they've done, their works and their deeds in this body, whether good or evil. See, you're going to stand before the judge and give an account, all right? Are you with me? Jesus said in, John, in Revelation 22, 12, Behold, I come quickly. My reward, my recompense is with me to pay or to give, pay for service, to give to every man according to his works, according to his deeds. All through the Old Testament, New Testament, every one of us is going to be judged according to our works and our deeds. The lost will be judged according to their works and deeds at the great white throne judgment. And the books, plural, will open and God judged every man according to his works or his deeds. And we could go on and on after scripture after scripture concerning that. See, God wants you and I to repent, folks. And then notice, and I will kill her children with death. That's the followers. That's all the group that wants to follow after false doctrine and false teaching and erroneous teaching and error and all of that and participate in all of this. He says, uh, uh, guess what? He says, death. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Amen? The Bible says the soul that sinneth it shall die. The Bible says when sin is finished it bringeth forth death. Therefore the believer would be a premature death. Hello, the Bible teaches that. God says, if you don't straighten up, child of God, and you keep living and going the way you're going, you're coming home. I'm going to first put you under such distress and tribulation unless you repent. He does that to cause you to repent. And He says, if you don't repent, repent. He said, I'm going to kill you. Isn't that what it says? 
but I will kill her children with death. Whoa! What happened to the loving God? Well, the Bible tells me in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 and 8, He talks about God loves those who He loves. He scourges and chases. He's going to discipline you if you're a child of God. And then He says, if by any chance there is no discipline, there's no chastening in your life, then the Bible says, the writer of Hebrews says, then you are not a child, you are a bastard. That's what the Bible says. You're not legitimate. You're not real. You're a pretender. And you'll be cast into the deathbed of hell with Jezebel. But for the child of God here, he says, you'd better repent. If you don't, you're coming home early. Because you can go over to 1 John and you can read about it where it says about praying for the sin unto death. He says, I pray that you don't pray for it, but it's there. There is a sin unto death for the child of God that wants to live his life the way he or she wants to, live in sin, compromise, live like the world, into idolatry, into sexual immorality, claim you're saved, know the Lord, and yet you don't straighten up. God sends a preacher like me to preach and tell you the truth because we love you and want you to get right with God, but you don't do it. God will kill you. Amen. Now next week we'll probably have less people here. Somebody's got to tell you the truth. Amen. Jesus is the one writing. My Bible's in red. And this is the one Jesus is talking, and he's talking as a divine judge to this church. And this is what he's saying. And he means what he says. He's going to do what he says. Are you with me? Amen. And yet there'll be the stubborn people that just refuse to do it when you have all the opportunity to get repent and get right with God. Yeah. Why won't you do that? Now, if we want to, and because that word term there, great tribulation, is not speaking of eschatology, of end time study, even though we're in the book of Revelation, even though this is the book of eschatology, even though it's in the end times, but what chapters are we in? Chapter 2 and 3, which is the present tense, the things which are, which is the church age. Are, are you listening? That's why he's dealing with the church now. Now, if we want to apply it as an application, Watch this. This is good. He said, this is good. I will kill her with, the, with death, verse 23, and all the churches, plural, what? Shall know that I am he which searches. That word searches is a present participle which continually, repeatedly searches the reins and what? Hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Are you with me? Now that's this majority group he's talking about. But we also want to talk about that great tribulation if we were looking at an eschatology, you see. Those that want to live in sin and continue to live in sin and don't want to trust the Lord and get saved, guess what? What is the tribulation period all about? Judgment. It's the judgment of God on a Christ-rejecting world and the discipline of the nation of Israel for rejecting their Messiah. That's what the tribulation hour is about, okay? It's a time of severe judgment from heaven, okay? And to those that don't want to get saved, you don't want to repent, you don't want to get right, and you're still living in the next hour, and the trumpet sounds, guess what? You're going to be cast into the great tribulation. Are you with me? That's what it says. So you see, you can take it both ways and use it as an application if it's speaking of eschatology. All right, here's the command. Verses 24 and 25. But unto you, now we're coming back to the remnant. All right, we're back to the remnant now. Are you with me? I say, uh, I say, ah, and unto the rest in fire tar. And now here, here, how do we know this is a remnant? Look at here. As many as have not this doctrine. How about saying, I want to be this, this part. I want to be in this group. I don't want to have this doctrine. Amen? Amen? And which have not known the depths of Satan, you've not tolerated sin, compromised, become worldly, lustful, all that, and all the stuff we talked about already. As they speak, notice, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which you have already hold fast, now notice he's talking about the second coming. 
Hold fast till I come. A and B of your outline there. I will put upon you none other burden. You know the burden they were under? Are, are you ready for this? Are you ready? For, this was from, coming from the church. From the 80% to the remnant. They were putting such stress and such a burden on the, the, the remnant to join with them and to follow the false doctrine and erroneous teaching and putting pressure on them and solicitating them and getting them to get involved and to follow and all of that. And they were all under that burden, that group. And Jesus said, I tell you what, I promise you, I'm not going to put any other burden. He didn't say take that one away. He said, but I'm not going to put any other burden on you because you're already going through enough. But I want you to hold fast to what you got. Hold fast to what? Your love, your faith, your patience, your service to the Lord that we talked about in the beginning. Hold fast to what you got, you remnant. Hold fast to that, notice, until I come. So you see why we're going to be under a lot of pressure? You see why we're going to get it from all the rest of them? Because we won't join their philosophy, their doctrine, their group. We won't become popular. Uh, we're going to be talked about. We're not going to be the most popular church in town. You see, and, and you're going to go through that because we're not going to compromise and join all that group. And it's a burden. Believe me, it's a burden. As a pastor, it's a burden. I hear it many times in conversations, in talking. And God said, this is an encouragement to me. He just said, you just keep going. You just keep being that remnant. You just hold on fast, preacher, till I come. And the word hold on fast, it means that it won't be easy. It's not going to be easy, church, to take a stand for Christ in a world in which we live. It's not going to be easy to be, uh, take a stand for right biblical doctrine in the world in which we live in. And we're already being persecuted from it. We will continue, and then it's all from the church. Wow, that is sad, isn't it? But the Jesus said, I want to encourage you. He said, you hold fast to what you got. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't compromise. Don't change. Don't water it down. Don't sugarcoat it. No matter how popular you don't become, no matter how unlike you get, you hold fast until I come. Amen. Now, if we want to go back and look at it to the eschatology part of it, I will put no other burden upon you you hold fast till I come. Guess what? Before the great tribulation and all hell breaks loose, I'm getting out of here by the way of the rapture. Hallelujah. You see. Hang on, church. And hold on. We got just a little bit more to go and the blessing's right around the corner. Jesus is just about to knock on heaven's door. God the Father's about ready to say, Mount up. Gabriel, get your lips wet. Get the best trumpet you got. Get ready to blast. Get ready to shout. Because the church is coming up. Because I promised them I wouldn't put any more burden on them. And if they would just hold on till I come, even it won't be easy, church. It is good stuff. You learn something today from the Bible. What the Word of God says. Wow, that's fantastic. You should have filled in your outline. Burden and fast. Not, not bad, is it? Matter of fact, Galatians 6, 9 says this, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. What are we going to reap? Glad you asked. We're about ready to close. Are you ready? But let's look at the council first of all. Look at verse, uh, uh, 20, uh, look at verse 29 with me, the last verse of this, for this church. Let's look at the council, and then we'll come back to verse 26. Look at the council. Here's the council. What? We're not, to, we're not to reap. We're not to faint in well-doing. Hang in there because we're going to reap if we don't faint. Won't be easy. Here's the counsel. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Do you have an ear this morning? Are you listening to what the Spirit of God says? Don't listen to this preacher. You listen to the Spirit of God. You listen to the Word of God. And as long as I'm quoting it right and reading it right and preaching it right and telling it right, you can listen to me too. And Lord willing, I'll have enough courage and guts to tell you when I'm not. And I'll tell you, don't listen to me. Go listen to somebody else. But by then, I'll be dead and gone to heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, so what is the counsel? 
We'll go back to verse 26. Here's the counsel. Are you listening? Verse 26. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works, when? Until the end. Are you with me? B, he that overcometh. Are you overcoming? Who's an overcomer? One who's born of God. 1 John 5, 4 and 5. Amen? That's the qualification to be an overcomer. You've got to overcome the world. You've got to overcome tolerance. You've got to overcome immorality. You've got to overcome idolatry. You've got to overcome eating things sacrificed. See, that's what you've got to overcome. That's what he says. He that hath an ear, listen to what the Spirit of God says to you today. You need to overcome. You need to hang in there even though it won't be easy till I come. You don't need to faint and well do it because I've got something wonderful for you. Amen. See, that's what keeps you going. He said, He that keepeth my works... Or Christ's deeds, if you please. What were they? Verse 19. Charity, service, faith, patience. You see, those are the works. Those are the things we're to keep. We already talked about them. He that keepeth those things. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. And when are we to keep those things? To the amen. end. Perseverance, steadfastness, and obedience is the genuine earmarks of a genuine believer. Jesus says, the real true believer, the remnant, will keep my works, my deeds, until the end. You will hold fast, you will persevere, you will love, you will have faith, you will have service, you will have patience, perseverance, endurance, until the end. What? The keeping His works. Not to be saved. I don't have to endure to be saved. I'm already saved. You see. Hallelujah. See, there's the earmarks. And see, what do we see in the church today? We see everybody else going the other direction. Why? There's only a remnant left that's doing this. Everybody else is in another boat, rowing up a different stream in a different direction, and yet they accuse me that I'm marching to the beat of a wrong drum. Well, go right ahead. <laughs> I know one thing. I'm marching to the beat of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Look at the last, number eight. Now let's look at the promise. Now remember, the promise only comes to those that are hearing. The promise only comes to those that are overcoming. The promise is only those that are keeping Christ's works, His deeds. See, that's what you've got to keep that to get it. Amen? You can't faint. You can't get weary and well doing. Here's what the promise is. Notice you get two things. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Notice the two things you're going to get right here. Number one, uh, verse 26 there. And to Him I will give what? Power over the nations. Power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of potter shall they be broken to the shivers, even as I received of my Father. See, God of Jesus, God gave Jesus all power and authority over everything. Amen? And the Bible says in Revelation 19, He's going to rule with a rod of iron, the Lord Jesus Christ. But here, to the overcomer, to the one who keeps faith, a service, a, a patience, a works, endurance, and does them until the end, and doesn't think, guess what? God is going to give you power and authority over the nations. Look out, Washington, because here I come. Amen. That's during the millennium, by the way. In the millennial kingdom. See, you've got to decide what you want to do. What group you want to be in. We're going to get to rule in the millennium. We're going to get help Christ carry out all His duties and functions during the millennial kingdom as He sets up His throne and His headquarters in Jerusalem on His father's David there in the temple in Jerusalem. And you and I are going to be His ambassadors. We're going to be His presidents. We're going to be His kings. We're going to be His judges. Hallelujah. Man, glory. But that's only to those who, what? Overcome. That's only to those who keep my works. You're going to get power and authority over the nations. And guess what? There isn't going to be no election. No Democrats going to put me in office. No Republicans going to put me in office. No independent party is going to put me in office. No appointee by the president. No, I'm going to be appointed by the commander-in-chief of all the universe. I'm going to be appointed by the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the King of glory, God Himself. Hallelujah. But that's if you be an overcomer and you keep His things. And then notice the last gift He's going to give to you. Ooh, glory. Somebody say glory. glory. Good, I knew you could all say it. 
Look at here. Verse 28. And I will give him the morning star. Who's the morning star? Yeah, I believe so. Turn to Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16. Revelation 22, 16. Everybody there? Say amen. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16. Watch this. I who, Jesus, have set my angel to testify unto you these things where? In the churches. What is the angel to testify? Now remember the word angel there is the messenger. God has sent this pastor to testify to you, my friend. Are you with me? In the church. That I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Oh, glory. You can cross-reference that with 2 Peter 1.19. If you want to write it down, 2 Peter 1.19 where Peter refers to Christ as the morning star. So what does that mean? Be there, you're going to get the morning star. It is Christ Himself. Two applications to that. Number one, you're going to get the very presence, or you're going to get all the fullness of Christ Himself. Can somebody shout? You understand what God's going to give to an overcomer? and keeps those things, you are going to get all of the fullness of Christ Himself for all eternity. Whoa! I can't even fathom that. I can't even imagine that. That God wants to, Christ wants to give to me Himself in all of His fullness that He is. Hallelujah! Glory to God! Oh, my. Then if we look at it in one other aspect, you and I will reflect the glory of Christ for all eternity. You can go to, don't look it up, we're out of time. And I know we're out of time. You can go to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. One of the most powerful passages in Scripture concerning uh, the end times, the end of tribulation, the reward that God's going to give. They shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And those that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. You're going to reflect Christ's glory for eternity. And you can also go to Matthew 13, 43, where Jesus said, we will reflect His glory in eternity. Now for all you believers sitting out here and those in those churches say, well, I want those things. Then you'd better get out of this group and get into this group. You'd better get out of the majority now and get into the minority. You'd better get out into what's popular and get into the unpopular, the remnant. You better get out of the compromising and the tolerating and the worldliness and the corruptness and immorality and and all that junk and all that stuff that Jesus talked about to his church here. You need to get out of that and you need to get into the minority group over here, the remnant that's left, and so that you can have these things. See, everybody wants all this stuff, but they don't want to work for it. They don't want to pay the price. And so what's his answer? Repent, repent, repent. Can't get out of it. Five of these churches, he told, repent, 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 repent. And if you don't, guess what? I'm the divine judge. Woo! Some of you are going to die early. Some of you are going to get the fire spanked out of you. And God's got a big stick. You know how big his stick was? When he turned his wrath and his judgment into a cross that he made and there was his big stick and he hung the perfect son of God on it for you so that you could have what we're talking about and if you reject that you spurn that you spit on that then you're going to get the other side of the stick on the front of the cross is Jesus On the back of the cross is his judgment. 
Which do you want? But friend, if we haven't run out of time, would you come to Christ today? Would you trust Him and believe on Him if you're not saved? Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and His shed blood on the cross of Calvary and accept Him as your Lord and Savior and become an overcomer and start living for Him so these things can be for you. And then, my dear friend, if you are saved, listen to me, listen to this preacher. You need to get back in the remnant. You've got to quit going where it's popular, where it's fun, easy, entertainment, excitement, all the hullabaloo and hullabaloo that goes on in, in the name of Christ, false doctrine, erroneous doctrine, teaching, compromising, sugarcoating, watering it down. Because the Lord said to this group, if you don't repent of it, He says, I'm going to put great tribulation upon you. And if you don't repent after that, He said, I'm going to kill you. That's heavy duty stuff, people. But I didn't say that. Jesus did. He means what He says. So while you're still breathing, you got time to do something about it. Repent. Get right with the Lord. Come to Christ. I beg you in Jesus' name, for it's too late. Bow your heads and close your eyes with me. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's your faith in Jesus Christ. But would you pray with me right now? You've heard the message. Those of you that are saved, you need to pray a prayer of repentance. Repent and turn from your sin. Those of you that are lost, you need to pray a prayer of repentance and turn from your sin and turn to Christ. Pray with me. Dear God, that's right. Go ahead. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. I confess that I'm a sinner and I've sinned against you, God, and you alone. And I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me. And he will, my friend. I do now believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. You took my place. You paid my sin debt. I believe you were buried and you rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Right now by faith, I do call upon you, Lord Jesus, and receive you into my heart and life to be my Lord and my Savior and to take me to heaven someday when I die. Thank you, dear Christ, for hearing and answering my prayer and giving to me eternal life, everlasting life. Help me to live for you and to serve you till you come or I go home first. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. God bless you.